Hello. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Is the volume okay? Awesome. All right. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. We're going to get started, so get comfortable. There's some wine and some sparkling water in the back. If you want to help yourself to that now, go for it. My name is Shannon O'Neill, and I'm the curator of the Tamament Library and Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives. The Tamament Library and Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives documents, broadly speaking, movements for social change. Our records span thousands of collections from histories on the left and histories of labor organizing. We have been and are an important focus for history building, community building, and movement work. I'm so very honored to welcome you all to the 2023 Bernhardt Labor Journalism Award and Forum this evening. This is our ninth annual gathering, so cheers to us. And I'm really grateful that we have this space to continue to carry out this tradition that celebrates solidarity and community and invites joy, remembrance, and dialogue. Tonight, we're going to honor Alex Press for her article, Holly, Ooh, yeah, woo, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> Um, for her article, Hollywood is on Strike Against High-Tech Exploitation, that was published in Jacobin in July of 2023. And we'll enjoy a panel discussion on AI and labor with Jane Chung from Justice Speaks, Chris Kyle from the Writers Guild, and Suzanne DeCarava from the News Guild. Um, and before we get to that, I just want to say a few thanks to a few people. Um, first, I always want to thank NYU Facilities for their work in setting up this space um, and the space for us tonight. Um, NYU TV and Campus Media for recording and streaming our event. NYU Libraries external engagement for all of their event facilitation and support. And of course, our sponsors. So tonight is made possible through the collaboration of the New York Labor History Association, the New York City Central Labor Council, Labor Arts, and the Tamament Library. And if you have a chance tonight before you go, um, I really want to encourage you to stop by the Labor Arts pop-up exhibit, which is just on the other side of the atrium of the library. It's called Memory and Cloth, and it examines the lives of garment workers through the lens of their solidarity and shared struggle for worker safety. So if you enter through the glass doors between the elevators, the exhibit's immediately on your right there. So I'd like to invite now Joe Doyle to share some remarks about the New York Labor History Association. Thank you, everybody. Hi, um, I'm Joe Doyle. Um, I'm part of the New York Labor History Association, which was founded back in 1976 by um, trade unionists and academics and retirees and labor editors and people that wanted to, to form a bridge between past and present, between trade unions and, uh, and academia. Um, we do a whole bunch of things, including this uh, Bernhardt Labor History Prize. Um, we have a, a really fine newsletter with uh, constant updates with, uh, with um, book reviews and movie reviews. Um, you can reach, uh, read that, that newsletter. Um, it's edited really well by Keith Danish. Um, and uh, you can look online at newyorklaborhistory.org and find uh, all about it. Um, Keith did a, a splendid thing. We, we give a prize, the, um, the John Comerford Award. Um, this, it's gonna be in December, December 5th this year. And that's named after a, a leading, uh, 19th century uh, labor unionists, and um, he he did splendid things for the for the state of New York and the city of New York, including he was one of the movers in uh, in making City College come about, so there could be a, a good free education for for the the people of New York. Um, Keith Danish, the uh, editor of our newsletter, was looking into the into John Comerford's life and was curious where he was buried and couldn't find anything and finally tracked him down to Woodlawn Cemetery in, in Brooklyn and realized that there was no gravestone uh, you know, marking this, this very important 19th century labor leader. So Keith plunged in and he, he, he's raised some money and so there'll be a, a ceremony in a year or two out in Woodlawn and um, we'd invite you all to, to come be part of that. 
We, we show, the New York Labor History Association shows movies occasionally uh, as, as a Zoom, um, and uh, we also have a, um, a prize for some notable but unsung uh, trade unionist who doesn't get a paycheck but plunges heart and soul into the work of, of her union or his union. Um, we call that the Philoene Freed Prize. Um, that's named after one of our past presidents who happened to be the daughter of Sidney Hillman and um, Bessie Abramovitz Hillman. Um, and Philoene just died a few years ago, but talking to her, she was that bridge for, for lucky people like me that could talk to her and, and she could tell about uh, her, her mother's organizing down, down south and her father you know, making the amalgamated. And um, so I encourage you to join our organization if you'd, if you'd like to be in contact with people like yourselves. Um, the prize tonight is named after Deborah Bernhardt and we're lucky enough to have some of her children here, um, Alex and Sonia. And um, Deborah's spirit uh, lives, lives on. She's, she's, she's long gone, but uh, she, she created such a wonderful environment for, for trade unionists and, and people interested in labor. I'm going to give you now um, uh, Kate Whalen uh, from the New York City Central Labor, labor Council. Hi, I'm Kate Whalen. I'm the Communications Director for the New York City Central Labor Council, AFL-CIO. Um, the Central Labor Council brings together 1.3 million union members from about 300 unions from across New York City um, to support issues that are important to working people, including unions including, of course, the News Guild of New York and the Writers Guild of America East, who we are excited to hear from tonight. Uh, the CLC works to build worker power through political education and action and supporting economic development in New York City. We do that via three lanes, politics and legislation, communication and mobilization, and coalition building. But for many of you here tonight, the thing that you probably know us for is sending 80,000 people marching up Fifth Avenue every year at our city's Labor Day Parade. So keep coming out to that, because we really need the work. Um, we're also very proud to be a sponsor of the Bernhard Award, which celebrates incredible journalism that enhances people's understanding of worker history and the history of working people's movements in New York. And I also, Joe reminded me, want to plug our newsletter, which comes out every Friday morning at 8 a.m., where you can find everything that's coming up in New York City that our unions need you to come out and support um, in the upcoming events section. And also send me stuff, because I need the content, because I spend all day Thursday writing it. So you can sign up for that at nycclc.org. And I'm uh, pleased to introduce uh, Rachel Bredstein. Thank you, Kate. And I highly recommend the newsletter. Um, I want to say a special welcome to Deborah's family, um, John Bloom and Miriam Lewin, Alex Bernhard Bloom and Ada and Amaro, and Sonia, <clears throat> who you're going to hear from shortly. Uh, so Labor Arts is one of the last projects I worked on with Deborah, and it was founded in the year 2000 um, with uh, the idea that art was one of the best ways to communicate about labor history um, and that there's an artistic and cultural heritage to the labor movement that is too often forgotten. And Deborah, as head of the Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives, um, cared about labor's records, but she especially cared about the things that were visually impressive. So that's where we got Labor Arts, which creates online exhibits, in-person exhibits, which Shannon mentioned, the one across the hall. I hope you will stop by. Um, we have a contest for CUNY students called Making Work Visible. And if you know any CUNY students who are artists or writers, the deadline is December 4th, very soon. Um, in the spring, we do the Clara Lemlick Awards, honoring women in their 80s and 90s who have been lifelong activists in the tradition of Clara Lemlick at the Museum of the City of New York. Nominations are now open. If you have people to nominate, we would be delighted. Um, 
and we collaborate with a lot of the organizations who sponsored this and others around town. Um, I want to introduce Sonia Bernhardt Bloom, who's going to talk a little bit about the background, um, about why we decided to have a prize in labor journalism uh, for Deborah Bernhardt. Um, and I, I just want to say, I asked her to talk about herself. So if she does, that'll be terrific. Um, she's a Spanish-English translator, museum educator, researcher who graduated from Oberlin College with majors in Spanish and Latin American studies. She spent a year working and living in Buenos Aires, another year working as a museum educator at the New York Historical Society, and she currently works at the National Yiddish Book Center and teaches Yiddish to an amazing variety of groups all around and about. So, Sonia, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I'm a late arrival, actually, because I'm coming from, from teaching some seven-year-olds Yiddish this afternoon. So I'm so happy to look out and see such a wonderful crowd. Um, so in, in talking to Rachel about tonight and what to share, um, it's so hard to uh, be... <laughs> Hi, Amara. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Um, to speak, to say enough about mom. So we thought that we would maybe showcase a few of the featured images from this online exhibit that is on labor arts. Um, starting with, uh, this is a picture of Deborah celebrating the uh, the completion of a radio series project called New Yorkers at Work. Um, Mom had a lot of project ideas that were informed by her commitment to public history, so history for a wide audience, not just academics, but to a broader public, and for us to see ourselves in that history and, and have a culture of solidarity around it. So she had secured a grant to do oral histories and thought, that's great, we want to document all of these, but also, what should we do with them? And came up with this idea of doing a radio series. Um, here's the poster for it. I encourage everyone to go and look on the site where you can zoom in and, and see the details there. Um, another prong of this commitment to public history was lots of talks and events at Tamament, just like this one feels like it carries that spirit. Uh, this is. A little one there is, is Alex, my brother, who in this photo is just a year older than Amaro, his, his kid who's here tonight too. So from, from generation to generation. Um, on the left is Candace Falk, who is the editor and director of the Emma Goldman Archive at the University of California, Berkeley. And here in, in this image, she's holding a copy of her book, Love and Anarchy on Emma Goldman. Um, and then that's Deborah Bernhardt in the middle, and on the right is Gloria Steinem. So always, always exciting to see making her history personal. Um, one of her big, uh, great late successes was applying successfully for landmark status for Union Square Park. Um, this was a laborious and complicated process, uh, but it was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1997. And on the left is a labor arts poster celebrating the 2002 installation of six historic plaques in the park that illustrate important events in labor history having to do with Union Square. And on the right is the, the plaque itself um, that's located in the plaza on the, on the south end of the square. And I just wanted to read it because the, the text is just so powerful. The site possesses national significance in commemorating the history of the United States of America. Here, workers exercise their rights to free speech and assembly, and on September 5th, 1882, observed the first Labor Day. This picture, 
uh, features me. Um, <laughs> and, and Deborah standing in front of a display of Ordinary People, Extraordinary Lives, which was co-written with Rachel Bernstein and uses some of those same oral histories that were used in the New Yorkers at Work radio series. Um, and the book documents the lives of working people in New York through pictures and stories. And there's a new soft cover 20th anniversary edition that I encourage everyone to take a look at in the back. Yes, Joe is holding it up. Wonderful. Um, and so pictures and, and art and storytelling and journalism are all connected to this public history. And with this award, we hope to continue to encourage non-historians to use history to better tell those stories and reach wider audiences. So thank you all. Thank you, Sonia. That was wonderful. She didn't mention that the exhibit is something she helped put together as an intern at Labor Arts a number of years ago. So it seemed like the perfect thing for tonight. Um, I now want to introduce Mike Conswitz, who has been a really terrific supporter of this event and of Labor Arts. Uh, he was um, a curator at the Tamament Library Wagner Labor Archives for many years. He's now the Associate Director at NYU's Institute for Public Knowledge, which does really interesting things. And he's a historian who takes on challenges. He once worked for the National Archives at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library um, and helped make the museum's nonpartisan Watergate exhibit. Now think about trying to make a Watergate exhibit at a Nixon museum uh, that's in the heart of Nixon country in Southern California. And now, then he went on to write a book that is entitled, They Said No to Nixon, Republicans Who Stood Up to the President's Abuses of Power, a particularly relevant topic today. And he's currently working on an authorized biography of longtime progressive activist Tom Hayden. And in his spare time, he's one of the judges on the Bernhardt Committee. And I'd like to recognize the other judges. Tom Robbins is here. Thank you, Tom. Shannon serves on it. Erwin Yellowitz, who's the president of the New York Labor History Association, couldn't be here tonight. He's with us online. Um, Kate Whalen from the Central Labor Council, and I, we're the group who read all of these amazing articles, and now Mike is going to introduce the one that rose to the top. Thank you, Rachel, for the kind introduction. Thank you all for being here. It's uh, great to see many familiar faces. Uh, it's my honor to be a part of the selection committee. Uh, I've been a part of the committee for the last nine years now. Uh, and it's, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that it's the, uh, despite the constant struggles that many reporters face, uh, the selection process is always a nice reminder of the creative ways that, that journalists uh, find the document stories. Uh, of today's working class and linking them to our history. This year, as a few people have already mentioned, we selected Alex Press's Hollywood is on Strike Against High-Tech Exploitation. Uh, it was published in Jackman this past summer. The article, like others that she has written over the last few years, uh, uh, few years, you know, makes that link very clear between the past and the present. Uh, during our discussions, we all agreed that Press's article uh, offers us a balance of on-the-ground reporting with actors and writers and analysis, uh, serious analysis of the strikes that provide readers with a history of Hollywood to better understand how a, a writer on a hit show can attend an award show with a negative bank account. Uh, that's one of the more memorable lines from this piece. Press details not only the, the more troubling industry proposals related to AI, but also other efforts to drastically reduce labor costs, smaller writing rooms, and other other measures. The article makes it clear that like other sectors of our economy, Hollywood has been further gigified in recent years. 
Uh, one quote that jumps out in the piece, art suffers when you're overworked and taxed this way. Uh, that's a quote from one writer. The piece also makes sure to include some necessary hope, uh, much needed hope. Uh, press shows how both striking actors and writers have made it clear that they recognize the similar threats they face from gigification and new forms of technology uh, that other workers also face. Uh, the piece mentions at one point that Am Amazon drivers and rank and file Teamsters attended both the UPS and WGA rallies in California this past spring, uh, which I thought was, was very, uh, very hopeful. One SAG after member told press, the actors have finally shown up to high five the hotel employees, the UPS workers, the rail, work, uh, the rail workers, the WGA, women in the exotic dancing industry. We're saying, I don't know exactly what your struggle is, but I know someone is not treating you as well as they should. How about as we're walking, tell me what's going on so I can show up for you. As part of the selection committee, I can say that the only thing that hurt Alex was that two of her articles were nominated. Uh, <laughs> They're serious fans of her work, uh, the other being her March 2023 article on the UAW, uh, which also you know, we seriously considered. The group was split over which piece to, to pick, but we eventually settled on a consensus. Uh, it was like you know, when a basketball team has two serious MVP candidates and they split the vote, but fortunately, uh, you know, Alex still won this award. So I just thought it was appropriate to bring that up because I think it speaks to the breadth of Alex's work along with her passion for documenting the evolving story of labor in this country. Uh, so I want to thank Alex and congratulate her for winning this award. Alex Press. Oh, and here's a copy, uh, a copy of Ordinary People, Extraordinary Lives. All right, um, I'm going to attempt to keep this short. Thank you everyone who's here, everyone who put this evening on, everyone who organizes this award. There are so many of you who've already spoken that I'm not gonna start naming you because I'll get something wrong um, and then I feel really bad about it. Um, so I guess I just wanna say a couple things. First, you know, um, I guess as Mike kind of laid out in his comments just now, like this is a really exciting moment. You know, UAW, actors, writers, like these are very high profile strikes that have been huge successes, I would say. You know, SAG is still on strike, um, so don't wanna jinx it. Um, but things are looking good. Um, and you know, I'm a product of this moment. I'm in the News Guild. I, we're gonna hear from the president of my local shortly. Um, and you know, I've been, I helped organize a grad union that's now in the UAW. And so it really feels like I'm very lucky um, to get to write about my class. Um, and the people around me that I've known for a long time. Can you hear me okay? I don't know, I don't, okay, cool. Um, so I guess a few people I wanna thank specifically. Um, I first wanna thank you know, the people that spoke to me that I spent time with for this article. Um, I don't think any of them are here. This one was LA based, though I definitely spoke to some WGA folks on day one of the pickets here um, and in the many months that you were on strike after that. Um, but, you know, I remember after we published this one, a few people in the industry said, you know, every time you write about Hollywood, it reads like you worked there for decades yourself. And it's totally thanks to the many people who are very generous with their time um, that that's at all true. Um, I also want to thank my coworkers who are here. Some of them are over there, especially my editor, Micah Utrecht, um, who has been there for me many, many times in many ways over the years and also trust me when I say things like, I'm gonna, I need to get to LA tomorrow. Um, he understands that something great is gonna come of it, even if he's not really certain that I have an actual plan. Um, and then um, other than thanking everybody involved in putting this on, especially the members of um, the Bernhardt family who are here, um, I guess I wanna say something else before I cede my time to the panel. Um, you know, it'd feel weird to accept a journalism award um, without mentioning that there is currently the deadliest conflict ever, um, in, or at least in many decades, for journalists happening right now. Um, I think 36 journalists have now been killed in Israel-Palestine over the past month. Um, the Committee to Protect Journalists says this is the deadliest uh, conflict for journalists since they began keeping the numbers in 1992. Um, so I'd like to say that, you know, in the room, 
we have people from the WGA, from the News Guild, from other unions, from the labor movement. Um, and I think there are a few things we really need to do right now. Um, you know, one is push for greater press freedom, press access into the Gaza Strip, including, in, including urging through our unions um, that international journalists be let in and not forced to be supervised by the IDF while they're in the Gaza Strip. Protections for those already in the Gaza Strip. These are things I know I'm proud that my union um, supports, and I think it's just I want to emphasize that this is really an important moment to push on that. Um, and then, you know, for the other labor folks in the room, it's not just happening there, it's not just happening for journalists, you know. So many people are being, are facing repercussions at their jobs right now for speaking up about this. Um, these, this is a workers' rights issue. Um, and I think the labor movement in general um, would be failing its members to not be sure we're protecting each and every person um, in this moment. Because, you know, if we let somebody get fired now, it could be you next. Um, bosses are gonna use that as a precedent. Um, so, that said, um, thank you everyone. You know, I have people from so many parts of my life here, um, and it really feels like an honor to get this award, especially this year, um, when finally there is, as Mike said, some hope. So, thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alex, and, and congratulations. It's really wonderful to have you and everybody here. Um, I have to explain that we chose the topic of the panel before we figured out who was gonna win the prize. So it's entirely serendipitous that we're gonna add Alex to the Q&A part of the panel. Um, I would like to introduce Jane Chung, who will be our moderator, and while I'm doing that, if the panelists wanna come up and sit at the table. Jane um, has been thinking about workers and technology for most of her career, which obviously isn't that long because she's so young. Um, she ran campaigns at the intersection of worker rights and tech accountability at the worker agency. She has organized and built advocacy campaigns, including at Public Citizen to fight and break up big tech. Um, she worked on Elizabeth Warren's presidential campaign and in agricultural development in Rwanda. She started her career at Facebook, which informs her analysis of technology, capitalism, and power today. She co-founded a new labor communications firm earlier this year, and it's called Justice Speaks. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jane. Thank you so much, Rachel. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, hi everyone, it's great to be here. Before I introduce uh, my fellow panelists here, I just wanna set the stage and talk a little bit about why AI is going to be crucial to the labor movement in the coming years and decades. We are here today to celebrate labor journalism, a crucial contributor to the rise in interest in unionism and workplace organizing over the past several years. Some trace this most recent surge in labor interest to the conditions of the COVID-19 pandemic, which shed light on the extent to which the boss prioritizes profit over people and subjected workers to unprecedented levels of surveillance, monitoring, and exploitation, driven in part by the proliferation of artificial intelligence. But the pandemic also revealed how much power we have as workers when we come together. We learned that our bosses could, in fact, pay us more, give us more control over our time and schedules, or in state health protocols that protect us and our colleagues. And when the boss refused, we joined hands and fought back for improved pay, conditions, a voice, and dignity on the job. Alex Press has been detailing these fights and is being awarded today for her reporting on the role that technology and artificial intelligence are playing in the SAG-AFTRA contract negotiations. Recent reporting suggests that AI provisions are one of the remaining disputed proposals in these negotiations, foreshadowing the critical role technology and AI will play in our future labor fights. I currently help tell stories of Amazon warehouse workers who are subject to computers that dictate their motions every second on the job, gig workers who move and work at the will of an algorithm, 
called by Los Deliveristas Unidos here in New York City as their jefe fantasma, or ghost boss, and of data workers who train the AI models that bosses are forcing on workers and are themselves organizing to improve their wages and conditions. Just this morning, Google tech workers who are fighting the company's $1.2 billion contract with the Israeli military and government were profiled in the New York Times for speaking up in support of Palestine and subsequently being harassed, reported to HR, and retaliated against. But the workers will not stop organizing until the boss creates a safe environment for all and until Google cancels this $1.2 billion AI contract with Israel. This is the power we have as workers when we come together. We can win better lives for ourselves, for the strangers next to us, and even for communities across continents. As we move into a panel on how labor is responding to the introduction of artificial intelligence to the workplace, please keep any questions you have in mind as we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the program. Without further ado, I'm honored to be here with my two panelists, and I will allow them to briefly introduce themselves. Thank you, Jane. Can you all hear me? Hi. OK, I'll start. Uh, my name is Susan DiCarava. I am the president of the News Guild of New York, which is a local of the News Guild International. Uh, in New York, we represent nearly 6,000 media workers, journalists, nonprofit workers, and also, if you happen to pass through Penn Station or Grand Central Station, the folks that actually sell you newspapers at Hudson News. Um, very happy and delighted to be here on a night when one of our members is receiving an award for uh, much deserved for her journalism and excellence. Alex has been a force for progress, progress within our union itself. Um, and I'm here delighted to be here tonight with uh, my colleague from the Writers Guild East and to talk about AI. This is from our perspective in the News Guild, literally an existential threat. Um, to uh, journalism. Uh, it's about jobs, but it's bigger than that. It's about how much we know and understand about the world we live in and what our responsibilities and obligations are to each other as building a part of a collective good and a collective society that cares for one another. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I'm Chris Kyle. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Writers Guild East. Uh, it's one of two unions that represents Hollywood writers. There are about 7,500 members uh, here in New York, but about 40% of our membership is now journalists. They work in online media platforms like HuffPost and Vox, and also we have many members who work in broadcast news for places like WCBS. Uh, I was on the negotiating committee during this strike, long strike, over the last over five months this summer. Um, it was a very grueling period, and AI was a crucial part of what galvanized our membership and what we needed to win from the studios, and we did win what I think are very good protections for our members. Happy to be here. Thanks so much, Chris and Susan. So to start off, I wonder if you could help put us in the shoes of a worker, a member of your union. How is AI impacting the workers in your union today, and what are the fears they have of the impacts it may have in the future? I'll go for, in my industry, I think it's mostly perspective now. Um, one of our online media shops, uh, Geo Media, they did do an experiment over the summer where they put on several of their platforms AI-generated articles. They said it was a test, and if it was a test, it failed because there were many factual errors in the articles and also an ethnic slur. Um, so I think it was most successful at galvanizing the members. Uh, our digital media members are really fired up. They've started a petition and they got a thousand members of our union to sign. Um, so right now, I, I think it's more of a trying to stop it before it gets out of control is where the focus is. I think trying to stop it before it gets out of control is a good way to kind of summarize in general, I think, the state of our response as a labor union and across the industry. Um, my local represents traditional media, folks like the New York Times, Reuters, as well as um, places uh, like ProPublica, Consumer Reports, Jacobin, 
uh, the nation um, uh, insider. And what we have found consistently across the board is whatever the point of view or perspective of the media company, consistently the only people that are raising an issue and concern about transparency and accountability about the use of AI are the workers and the journalists within those companies. We've experienced things like employers sneaking AI into our platforms, um, not telling anybody that they're there. One day it just shows up on your back end CMS. Uh, content management system for those who are not familiar with acronyms, uh, and uh, and our members, uh, you know, organize around removing it from that. But we've also had very public examples uh, recently. Uh, our members at Gannett, which is a the largest media uh, percentage share of media in the country, they own 17% of the market, uh, rolled out fake stories with fake reporters and fake bylines, uh, and all generated by AI, and then claimed that they had not. Uh, our members had taken screenshots and basically confronted management, and it's become a huge issue. It's not the first time Gannett has tried that, uh, and it's deeply concerning when you think that Gannett owns mostly local outlets. So if you look at, for example, USA Today is kind of their their, their most well-known, nationally known product. But if you live in the Hudson Valley uh, and uh, you have Hudson Valley News or Poughkeepsie Journal, the oldest newspaper in New York State and the second oldest in the nation, or if you look at some of the Tribune-owned properties like the New York Daily News, New York's hometown paper, all of those have been devastated by cuts. And what we see is the companies seeking to replace the work of journalists with AI. Um, and our members have no illusions about what AI, uh, what AI can and can't do, right? AI cannot identify a source. AI cannot convince a source it doesn't want to talk to talk. <laughs> they can't engage and uh, exercise editorial judgment about what's important in a story. But what AI does is what we're concerned about overall about the craft of journalism is that it hollows out the process to the point where people don't expect better from the product that they're consuming, from the news that they're reading. And so for us, when I say it's an existential crisis, yes, it's about jobs. Yes, it's about the ecosystem that is created around those jobs. But it is also about generational knowledge gaps that are created in the public by the failure to continually invest in the role of journalism in our society, you cannot get that back. What do you do with generations of people that are essentially deliberately uneducated about their own civic engagement and process in democracy? If you think about that, it's pretty deep and it's scary. And so I think that's really what we are most concerned about in terms of holding companies accountable and trying to stem the tide of how AI and its use not only exploits labor, but exploits public trust and goodwill. Thanks so much for painting that picture for us. How have workers in your unions been organizing and fighting back for more voice in how AI is used on the job? And what victories have you seen? If any, Chris, maybe we can Start with you, with Chris. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, we have to start uh, planning for our negotiations uh, months ahead of time. So when we started, AI wasn't really on our agenda. But a couple of months into our committee's meetings, ChatGPT was released, and the stories came out about it, and people started to experiment with it and discover what it could do. And our members got, frankly, quite freaked out about its potential for taking away their work. Uh, a lot of them started talking about a future where screenplays are generated by AI and then maybe they hire a writer for a short time to give it that human touch before it gets made into a movie. So it became a really powerful issue for our members that we frankly weren't expecting when we were starting out. And it turned out that that was very fortuitous because 
we had a wide ranging agenda. We had things we wanted for feature writers, things we wanted for TV writers, things we wanted for comedy variety writers. And when you have an agenda like that that doesn't have an organizing theme, it can be difficult to hold the members together because the companies will come in and they'll make a reasonable offer in one area that will get those members happy and then they'll want to settle and end the strike, but the other members won't have gotten anything. And so what AI gave us was that unifying issue that affected everyone. Mm -hmm. Every single member, no matter how much experience they had, whether they were just starting out, whether they were at the top of their career, they all feared the potential of AI. So that held us together through five very long months. And it, it did turn out to be the trickiest issue to solve with the companies. It was the last thing we were negotiating the last few days before we finally made a deal to get everything from the definition of what AI is, because there are lots of different technologies that fall under the umbrella of AI, but there are particular areas that we were focused on, and whether they could use it to, whether they could use our work to train AI to create additional work, whether they could force us to use it, all these things we worked out in a satisfactory way. So uh, we're very pleased with it. I the work that you all did and the agreement that you reached is really kind of, I think, groundbreaking and spreads across sectors, right? I mean, yeah. uh, there there is a world of difference between entertainment writing and journalism, but I think that the same issues that you were battling against in that strike around AI apply similarly to journalism. Um, we had, uh, over the summer, a 14-day strike at Insider, which is a dig digital publication. It was the longest strike to record of a, of a digital publication. And one of the big issues was the editor-in-chief's very boldly stated intent to use AI in any and every way possible all throughout the company um, and saw no issue or limitations or concerns about uh, folding it into the processes of the newsroom. And uh, where we ended up there, which I think was a good place to start, um, was essentially having contractual guarantees that wherever the conversations are happening within the company about the int introduction and use of generative AI technologies, uh, that guild members would be part of that discussion. So whether it's on the high-level editorial board or whether it's you know uh, uh, in other forums throughout the newsroom or even past the newsroom in the company broadly, but that will impact the newsroom, uh, we will have representation at those tables. Uh, I think what we're looking to do, and I say this, you know, it's not a secret, is very much similar to kind of the things that were accomplished with the Writers Guild strike and subsequent settlement of that strike. Uh, our big concern is the use of our members' work to train AI how to be better at mimicking human beings. Uh, we don't want to contribute to that, <laughs> uh, and our members don't want to see that their work utilized in that way. Um, there is just really no, we don't have a lot of trust that employers will use it ethically or responsibly. And so our concern is not so much to try and, uh, I don't know, put our fingers in the dam and say AI will never come into this newsroom or into this company. I mean, I think that ship has sailed. We all understand it's here and it's a part of the modern work experience, but it's more about setting really good and strong guardrails uh, around it. We, the News Guild International, our parent union, just recently completed a study uh, of our membership across the board, and these were the things that came up consistently. People didn't want to see their work uh, gobbled up by AI and large language learning models in order to make it better. They didn't want to see it repurposed and exploited in ways that they didn't intend and had no say in uh, and were not compensated for. Um, and they also don't want to see their work replaced or their jobs replaced by the use of AI. So those are the things that we'll be bargaining even more intently and specifically for as we move forward. Um, and you know, we're in the middle of a big contract negotiations. We represent 700 tech employees at the Times. Um, and uh, that's a big issue because they see the things that no one sees, right? Which is the bias that gets folded into the programming of AI and of uh, technology um, because human beings are biased. But when you interact with technology, there's kind of assumption that somehow it's neutral 
of all of that, and we know that's not the case. So there are many different ways in which to attack it. We're gonna to continue to think, I see it evolve um, in our industry, but across the board, like this was a big issue with the UAW, it was a big issue with the Teamsters and the UPS negotiations. Um, you know, it's an issue in hotel workers. It's, it's all across all sectors. We're all going to be grappling with it. Artificial intelligence isn't, as you know, the first technology that the boss has tried to use to exploit and control workers. How do you see this era of technolo technological change powered in part by AI distinct from previous eras? For example, the rise of so-called citizen journalism, the shift to digital newsrooms, the rise of streaming services. Maybe we can start with you, Susan. Uh, well, I think all of those things, I mean, change is good, right? And progress is good and, and new exciting ideas are introduced and they expand our capacity uh, to both produce and experience the world around us. Um, I, I think what distinguishes this particular technological development is none of those others, although maybe at the time it, it felt like it, but none of those others really fundamentally undermine the nature of the work right, like journalism is journalism. Journalists go out, they find stories, they ask questions, they interview people, they paint a picture for you to understand and engage with really important issues of the day or memorializing um, cultural milestones, right, and how and who we are. Um, the possibilities of, in particular, generative AI and large language models to undermine that, when I talked before about the exploitation of public trust and of uh, our desire to know ourselves and the world around us, um, I think is very different from a change in production from print to digital or a change in uh, how people arrive in the profession when you talk about citizen journalism. And I think, you know, Earlier, we were talking a little bit about um, what makes this moment kind of different overall for labor. I think Alex talked a little bit about that and a few other people at the, at the, at the podium did. And um, in journalism, you know, it used to be that you started as a, well, it used to be only like copy boys, but we'll just say copy people eventually when they recognized women had a place in the newsroom, in the workforce. But, you know, you started out and you kind of like, as I said, made your bones and you worked your way up and you, you know, got attached to a reporter who took you wherever you go. You ran the, the pages and, and you did all this stuff and you kind of learned on the job. So there's a whole generation of journalists that were told you need to go to school in order to be a journalist, right? So they get out of journalism school they have mountains of debt, and then they go into a newsroom that wants to pay them $30,000, $35,000 a year and living in New York. Uh, and I think the idea of the pendulum kind of swinging the other way, radicalizing people because they realize that they've been sold a bill of goods in terms of what's possible. <laughs> uh, they don't have the same quality and level and escalation of standard of living uh, and professional development. And so to kind of wrap it back around to what's different, I think that context radically changes how we view the technology. Uh, News Guild contracts all contain language that say, you know, with the introduction of new technology, the company has certain obligations towards its workforce, right? We don't allow layoffs just because, you know, you've changed from an IBM typewriter to a computer, right? Uh, or a word processor, that was in between the two, right? There was a typewriter and there was a word processor, then there was computing. Um, uh, you know, there's training that's involved. There are ways in which we try and ensure that people have an opportunity to learn new technology in order to continue their professional growth. AI kind of says that that doesn't matter, right? I mean, you can't train a person. The whole point of AI is actually not to train an individual about how to do their job better. It's to replace parts of their job. And it has the potential, frankly, one of the, the most damaging things about it, when you think about newsrooms, they have hierarchies, right? And some newsrooms are very stratified. And you've got like kind of the stars, the people who can write the excellent stories and do no wrong and everybody loves them and they're generally closer to management. Uh, and then you have your kind of like rank and file reporters who are just out there following the story. 
Uh, and the idea that AI is going to produce some, a program is going to produce some like rough draft, and then it's just going to get a polish by some, you know, higher up gold star reporter, only not only reinforces those hierarchies, but also kind of again completely hollows out the very nature of what journalists do in the first place. And so that's why I think, to go back to your original question, sorry, there was a long way around there, but um, it, this is an extraordinarily different historical moment. Um, and I think it's part of why people are so concerned about what the implications are for the use of AI. Um, it's just, you know, as I said before, what that means in terms of the news that we consume, the information that we have access to, generations of people that don't know or understand what's going on in their board of education or their city council or uh, local elections. If you don't have it, then you don't know to ask for it or to expect it, and then it's gone. And we are deeply, deeply impoverished by that as a society and as a culture. Uh I don't, want, I don't want to add a whole lot. I thought that was a really good answer, so I don't want to add a whole <laughs> lot to that. Um, I would say that the thing that AI, that strikes me about AI is that it feels like the continuation of the digital revolution that we've been living through for the last 30 years, that as media and entertainment have been transferred from physical media to digital media, that the middle class of the workers who create that get hollowed out. Yep. Spotify hollowed out the middle class of musicians. The transition from DVD to online streaming hollowed out the middle class of screenwriters. Uh, digital media has hollowed, hollowed out the middle class of who used to work for local newspapers and things. So this is happening all through our culture. And AI is now going to be able to take all that content, all that entertainment, all that reporting that now exists digitally, learn from it, and then just completely eliminate the rest of the humans. So. It just does feel like, to me, a culmination of what's been going on for the last 30 years. I don't know if we have time for one more question before we open up to Q&A. OK, let's do that. <laughs> sure. Um, so now we'll open it up to any questions folks have in the audience and invite Alex up. Um, I think there are ways to ask questions on the live stream as well if folks want to reach us that way. Hi. Congrats to Alex. Um, I'm just curious, everything you said makes AI seem really bleak, but obviously we can't stop it. Is there any positives from the journalist side of AI at all? that we can maybe somehow look forward to. <laughs> I mean, I think, our, I, I, you know, broadly speaking, I don't know what you've heard, Chris, but uh, on our side, I think they're excited about the ability to um, access and analyze huge mounds of data in a, a faster or more targeted way, you know, where before it might have taken, you know, a conference room full of reporters an entire year to go through, for example, Donald Trump's tax returns, um, you know, you do have the possibility of using this technology as long as it's direct, it's correctly programmed and directed to what to look for, which you need people for. Uh, uh, I think they're excited about what that what that can do. Um, in terms of um, kind of finding the needle in the haystack. Um, and I think also generally people are kind of intrigued by the idea of um, ways in which you can use, use this for good. It's just so far most of the examples that we've seen have been in surface of pro for profit, for corporations. <laughs> Uh, uh, and entities that are not interested in it as a um, expression of the best of what humanity can do, but rather simply another way to exploit and wring more cash out of the system into executive pockets. I mean, that's literally how we've seen it used in journalism. So uh, yes, there, there are like a few glimmering lights out there, but it's really about getting access to it and being able to guardrail so that it is used that way and not the other ways that we've talked about. 
I, I think the best thing about it is that it really motivates the workers to fight back. <laughs> it motivates them to organize, to, to talk back to management, to be willing to go out on strike to get what they need. So in a way, it's a kind of a mirror effect. But um, I don't hear a whole lot from our members of positive things that they're looking forward to working with AI. <laughs> It's true that bosses are often our best organizer. Yeah, so often. <laughs> AI is a tool of the boss. Hi. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the News Guild. I was part of a unit uh, at Kaplan uh, International. Oh uh, my gosh. That I hope that I hope that chapter is still doing well. But uh, they. Uh, the News Guild organized us uh, into, uh, it was a, an ESL school, and uh, uh, teachers do a lot of uh, unpaid labor preparing yeah. lesson plans, and it, it, you know, it sounds a little scary that it's already unpaid <laughs> and uncompensated, and I wonder if now the, this is another way that you could just plug things into a, a, a chat, you know, G, GPD and just come up with a lesson plan and and uh, you know and and also it could be tailor made for uh, you know school districts that want to uh, eliminate certain you know big swaths of American history and, and ignore it with a click of a button uh, such as happened almost happened with Scholastic so yeah, any uh, any information on uh, the teaching you know the uh, education and uh, the teaching and any news about uh, the, my Kaplan colleagues? Oh, your Kaplan right. colleagues. Uh, the Kaplan unit, well, first of all, very nice to see you. I'm delighted to hear about Kaplan. Uh, uh, Kaplan was a, a bit of an anomaly for us as, as the News Guild. And so um, over the years, that, that unit has unfortunately really whittled down as Kaplan has moved outside of, moved its headquarters and its teaching model, particularly with the pandemic, uh, towards an even more remote and um, dispersed workforce. So we still have a small representation within Kaplan, but um, I think mostly uh, right now, folks are looking at more kind of traditional representation for, for teaching within the labor movement. But I will say, I think the point that you raise is, is critical. Um, you mentioned Scholastic, which is another one of our, our units, and um, there, uh, some of you may have heard, but the decision was made where um, uh, they, Scholastic had um, moved, quote unquote, uh, challenging or controversial books. So basically books that dealt with anything that had to do with race, gender, identity, um, or quote unquote challenging history into like an optional column and you could, school districts could choose whether or not they wanted to even have that as part of the presentation. Um, and I think <laughs> while that was a decision that was made by some very wrong-headed people, uh, and it was a decision that was reversed because uh, uh, our, our members within Scholastic, in coordination with authors and educators as a coalition of people, really held Scholastic account for that decision, and they have since walked it back and attempted to apologize. It's still not over, but uh, it's, it's being corrected, I think, appropriately. Um, but I think that is an example of the type of thing that we have seen kind of bubble up through the use of, again, generative AI, because it is going to reflect the biases of the people that program it, and you will never know. And that's the most damaging thing. I mean, when you read a story uh, in the news and you don't like it, or you think that there's a problem with it, there's a name attached to it, there's transparency about who wrote it, you, just, you know who published it, you can access them. You may not be satisfied by the response, but there is a level of accountability there in terms of like who is doing the reporting and what did they report before, right? Does this, do you think that this represents, uh, you know, responsible journalism or not, right? As the public, you get to engage to a certain level with people. Um, when you have work that's produced by AI, who's responsible? Who's responsible for the decisions? Literally no one. <laughs> it's like that Spider-Man meme where everyone's pointing at it. <laughs> I mean, so um, I think that kind of thing, which we have seen with errors that have been produced in either fake stories or real stories that were produced by AI, 
um, decisions that were, you know, I think everyone's familiar with the, the now infamous indication of the, the lawyer that produced a brief that was full of fake references and, and cases that didn't exist. We see that all the time also within, within journalism. So uh, I think those are the things that we're, we're really worried about and fighting, fighting hard to prevent kind of seeping more into the, into the profession. We have a question from the live stream. Um, one of our virtual attendees asks, how would or should schooling of journalists change? Alex, do you wanna? No, you go first. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing all the talking. <laughs> Has schooling, say that again? I think they're asking with um, the inevitability of AI in the mm -hmm. future and its presence now what, how should journalism schools respond or how should curricula in journalism change? Labor studies should be required. <laughs> <laughs> Good I mean, fundamentally, that's why we're here and that's what we're talking about, right? The, the, the cure is people organizing, standing up for what's important, what they understand to be our collective values, the collective good, and fighting for it. You know, we say all the time that you get the contract that you fight for, you get the workplace that you fight for. Um, and uh, without any understanding that journalists are working people, they are not some elite somewhere. You know, we always talk about coastal elites and media elites. But the fact is, is that people do not get into journalism to get rich. It doesn't happen. The, it's like the MBA, you know, you see that like very high uh, one or two percent of people that achieve a level of fame or notoriety or uh, acclaim. But for the most part, journalists are working people who want to tell the stories of their communities. They want to ask the right questions. They want to understand the world around them. They want to translate it to people and they feel a deep sense of mission and civic duty and responsibility. Uh, and I think to a certain degree, uh, without a grounding and understanding that being a working person means that you have to fight <laughs> for fairness and for equity in a system that is stacked against you as a class and as an individual, it really kind of um, does a disservice to their ability to do the kind of work that they want to do. You know, we fight for things in our contracts like uh, just cause, which is a, a labor term that requires essentially due process uh, for someone who's facing discipline in the workplace. We do that not just because it's tradition and labor, but we do that because if you're in a newsroom and you're following a story and your editor says that's not the story that I want, which happens all the time, you need to have protection to be able to follow this, where the story is taking you, regardless of what your editor says. Um, when I was a rep years ago, I had a, an instance where we had an environmental reporter who had an editor who was a open climate denier. So you can imagine the conflict that they were in with their editor, right? Literally, their beat is environmental news, and the editor was like, no, I, I, don't, I don't think this has anything to do with you know, rising water temperatures or, or, or air quality or anything. And consistently, what they had to do was basically go over this editor's head or like go to the reporting and say like, this is what the story is saying. This is what the scientists are saying. This is what's happening. And I'm not changing my story. This is it. And they d did that because they felt that they had the protection of their colleagues as, rep as being guild represented, right? We were all kind of shared the same value of follow the story. Um, and so when you're coming up through school and you see all these other things, how do you, how do you get ahead? You know, how do you get a mentor? How do you learn how to do the things of journalism? You also have to learn that it's okay to act collectively. It's okay to speak up. Like it's not gonna hurt you professionally. You will be a stronger and better reporter for it. There is a, such a grand and proud history of labor activism within journalism. I think, just think it's a real shame that it's not incorporated more into the general um, curriculum for, for, for J schools, and it should be. I, I just fundamentally think that's. I also required. have, I'll cover a very different part of the Please answer do. to that, which is <laughs> my understanding is that journalism school is a 
huge waste of your money and time. Um, <laughs> it seems to be really good for getting, if you don't already know rich people from uh, Ivy League schools, you will meet them at journalism school, and that does help. Um, but that is, I, I certainly didn't attend journalism school, and some of the greatest journalists in US history right. didn't either. Um, and so I just, you know, there are many, I, I wish the only problem was that journalism school wasn't addressing like new technologies, <laughs> but actually they're not teaching people like basic yes. things um, that you end up learning once you start on a beat or start, yeah. you know, again, at whatever position you get into. Um, so my advice is always to just like learn deeply about whatever it is that you would be interested in covering. For me, I was organizing unions and I became a labor reporter. Just have something to say uh, and be easy to talk to. <laughs> uh, way more useful than journalism school. Um, yeah. There, there is a lot of work to be done. Um, thank you, all of you, and congratulations again, Alex. I have a few um, reminders before we uh, adjourn and have some of the wine at the back of the room. Um, join the New York Labor History Association if you haven't already. Um, and our next event, the Comerford Awards, as, as you've heard, is Tuesday, December 5th at 6 p.m., and it will be virtually hosted by NYU um, and the Tenement Library. Kate Whalen's newsletter every Friday morning is essential. She spends all day Thursday on it, um, and it's worth uh, signing up for. Labor Arts and Tamament would both invite you to sign up for our occasional newsletters and come to events. And I want to end by saying something about the culture of solidarity, which a lot of people have mentioned. Um, everyone in this program is a part, in one way or another, of something Deborah and I wrote about in the Ordinary People, Extraordinary Lives book. Um, a culture of solidarity that can be found throughout our country's history in different forms with times of considerable strength and times of a lamentable divisions and terrible setbacks. Um, but it's a culture of solidarity where people go beyond the American dream of individualism and see hope in working toward the welfare of the many. And I just want to mention at the end that at times when that culture is strong, alliances and collaborations with artists and creative people are strongest. So I'm delighted that we have some um, writers and screenwriters and people, jur creative journalists here in the room. And I think it's a wonderful tribute to Deborah Bernhardt. And here's to carrying on till next year. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.